We're gonna continue on our core value of uh, the presence of God. Um, and the presence of God is um, the first core value that we wanna share. We've been doing this for, um, I guess, a few months now. And um, there's four core values that God has uh, shown us that are gonna be a part of our community and will continue to be a part of our community. Uh, presence is one of them. We believe that the presence of God is powerful, that you can encounter God's presence that he inhabits the praises of his people, that you can have an encounter to be an encounter. Uh, we believe in the power of prayer. We believe that prayer is powerful, that God hears our prayers, that prayer actually works, it changes things, and, uh, and that healing prayer is important. And so we believe in that. We believe in uh, transformation. We, we believe that God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will continue to sanctify you and set you free from demonic torment, from deliverance of things that you've been struggling with all your life, we believe that God uh, can set you free. That's not just behavior modification, but there is real power in the transformation uh, of, of the Lord in your life. And then finally, we also believe in evangelism. We believe that everyone's called to evangelize, that the gift of God that's in you, the gift that he's given you, you need to freely give away. And that it's not just for me or for any evangelist to stand on stage and and that's when we bring people to Jesus, but it's actually when we go outside the four walls of this church and uh, tell people about Jesus. And so this is part of our core values, and that's why we're right now talking about presence. We'll be doing that for a while, and then we'll go into prayer. Um, I wanna start with 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 3. 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 3. talked about the reverence of God last week and the power of the presence of God and how powerful the Lord's presence is. And, and oftentimes we become familiar with it and familiarity uh, doesn't give us the ability to understand how powerful it is. And, and oftentimes um, we drive cars every day that are 2,000 pounds that go really fast and have a lot of force. And we've become so familiar with our vehicles, we don't realize how powerful they are until we encounter one or until our vehicle encounters something else, right? Then you see, wow, look at all the power that was in the thing I was actually driving every day, looking at trees and daydreaming while we have this powerful vehicle in our, in our hands. The reality is, is that the, God, the presence of God is powerful because it is him. When his presence is here, that means he's here. And, uh, and so we have this reverence for it. And, and I just love this moment in Second Chronicles uh, 7, 1. It says, as soon as, this is when they finished building the temple. They finalized it. It says, as soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. And when all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is what happens when the glory of God falls, the great gratitude out of our hearts that it should all point to Jesus. And, um, and some amazing things happen when the Shekinah glory comes, as Pentecostals would say. Uh, me growing up in Pentecostal church, I would hear about the Shekinah glory of God. Um, and the Shekinah is actually not even in the Bible. It's actually a, a rabbinical term that they would describe to talk about the glory of the Lord. It, it means to actually fill or rest or, 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 or settle in. And, 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 and I remember hearing the stories in old Pentecostal churches of in the 1900s before there was video cameras where the glory of the Lord would roll in like a cloud from the back to the front. And not one person would be standing at that point. You either fell over or you got on your face <laughs> saying, oh God, thank you. The awe of God came into the room and there was so much reverence and beauty and miracles happened and people came to Jesus. And actually, when I would ask you know, parents and grandparents of, uh, of those uh, times in, in particularly the denomination I grew up in, I'd say, what was it like? What was... And, and how'd you come to Jesus? And almost always they would say, oh, my grandfather, my grandmother went to a revival or saw the presence of God or had a healing or had a prophetic word and the presence of God was there and they got saved and their whole household got saved. But then generations later, we're growing up talking about the presence of God but not experiencing him. 
And so now we're, we're living off of stories and not experience that his word provides. And so when we talk about the Shekinah glory of God or the glory of God, it can manifest in many ways. I've talked about this before. There can be the joy of the Lord that fills you so much that you're just overcome with, you know, uh, laughter and, and joy. Uh, there could be the peace of God fills your heart and you feel this tremendous peace even when all chaos is around you. It could be that um, you're feeling electricity. There's a manifestation of power on your body and you get healed. Um, sometimes people don't feel anything and they just, this faith rises in their hearts and it's just like, wow, I never knew I could encounter God like this. Sometimes there's some crazy things that happen that just blow my mind. I don't understand it. I haven't experienced all of them, but there's some things like gold dust starts appearing. Like what? Like people are worshiping. Now listen, if you belong to my household, you know I hate glitter. <laughs> it's banned from that. I'm like, honey, do not buy. If you wanna get me upset, and don't do this as a joke, but if you... If you write me a card and there's all glitter on the front of it, I'm just like, you're on my list. <laughs> because I'm like, this, this will show up somewhere all the time, you know? Like, it takes years for the glitter to finally get away. And so, and so, um, and so I, you know, but, but it's like this experience of gold dust where it's like, you know, people are worshiping. It doesn't happen all the time. And, it, and I haven't, since I've been here, I haven't seen it happen. But, but you know, they're worshiping and they don't have kids, They're not, there's no glitter craft going on in children's church, that, but they look down and there's like gold on their heads and they, you know, and, and, they, and it comes back and it's just weird and it's like, why would God do that? Seriously, why would he do that? God, don't do that to me, I don't want glitter on me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just, God, I'm kidding. If you wanna do it, do it. But, but look, look, the reality is, is that these are signs that, and wonders, there, there's some, it's, it's what the Lord is doing. When he's manifesting, it's a sign. What do signs do? They point to something. You see a sign on a highway? It's telling you where this road will take you. The sign that God gives us doesn't require us to worship the sign. It requires us to worship the one who gave it. If it doesn't bring more glory to Jesus, if it doesn't bring more honor to God, then I don't want it, and I don't want us chasing it. I want us going after God, and if he shows up in any way that's possible, then wow. Trust me, if there's feathers coming in this place, I've seen you know, things where feathers, I'm like, who's wearing a down jacket? I mean, I'm the skeptical one. I'm like, we're getting the ducks cleaned in the church. You know, there's, We're gonna make sure there's no birds up there. We're, we're gonna do everything possible because I want it to be real. I want it to be authentic. And, um, and I don't want us to be in awe of the sign. I want us to be in awe of the one who gave us them. And so it's, it's important that when and if these things happen, that we just give way more glory to Jesus. Um, I was in Brandon, Manitoba just a few years ago, and one of the weirdest things uh, happened when we were ministering. We, went, uh, we were doing a conference, and, and um, I was speaking, I was hosting it, and I was leading it. And, um, and then uh, for lunch, uh, or actually dinner, we went to a restaurant. It's in Canada, in Brandon, Manitoba. It's actually... Sorry if you're from Canada, but it's like nowhere. I mean, I just, it's this town. It's a beautiful town, but it just took, took a while to get there. And, and uh, we, we went to this restaurant, and it's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever been to like an Olive Garden, but it's like, if, there's like this one table they have reserved if you're like a table of 12, and they have kind of a semi-private room there. And so we, we had a room like that in the, uh, in the restaurant, and after I got done eating, one of the uh, leaders of the church came up to me, and, and it, was, it was a lady, and she said, would you pray for me? And I said, now? She said, yeah, I, I just know you're busy, and after you're, I'm ministering when you're done preaching, and so I just, would you pray for me now? I'm like, in the restaurant? Okay, and so, um, so, she, so I'm praying for her, and you know, and, and I felt the power, I felt the presence of God come, come in that moment. And I'm like prophesying, I'm like saying, I'm like, man, I don't know if what you're doing in your home, but I feel like the Lord's made your home like an open heaven and angels ascending and descending and, and God's gonna be doing so much in your home. And, and she fell down right in the, uh, in the restaurant and, and I just slowly faded into the background. Just, you guys figure that out. And, um, 
And so that, you know, that's, and, and so then I go to church that night and, and right before uh, the worship starts, she, I'm sitting in the front row, she taps me on the shoulder. I said, hey, what's, what's up? She said, it's the craziest thing. You know, uh, first of all, I have a home group and what you're saying was, was totally the Lord. It's so encouraging to me. But she said, um, when I was telling my daughter what had happened during dinner, she said, mom, what's, what's in your mouth? And she said, what? She says, there's something in your mouth. She goes, what? She goes, nothing's in my mouth. She goes, open your mouth. She looks. She says, mom, you have a gold tooth. When did you get a gold tooth? She's like, I don't have a gold tooth. So she runs to the bathroom to check. And for some reason, God gave her a tooth that's gold. Now, why? I don't know. Now, she had a tooth that was bad, that the tooth that was bad, it was like dark, and God replaced it and gave her like a gold one. Now, why was it a gold tooth? I don't know. Why didn't he just make it normal? I don't know. I, this is one day I will go to heaven and ask him. Now, of course, my uh, analytical brain, and, and I, I said, well, I don't really know this woman, and I don't know... Uh, I don't have a history with her. I don't know her history. And so I, I got the pastor. I said, who is this lady? Is she okay? Is she, is she crazy? <laughs> and then he said, no, no, she's a great leader. She's been here for years. We're in good relationship. And I told, her, told him what happened. He's like, whoa, that's the Lord. She would never make anything like that up. And I thought, wow, it's amazing what God will do. So everyone go to the bathroom, check your teeth. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> But this is something that happens. It doesn't happen all the time. It's very rare. But when it does, I don't want us to be amazed by the miracle. I want us to be amazed by the, I mean, I want us to be grateful and amazed, but I want us to be worshiping the one who did it. And so that's just a, a, a thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, and then I also want to um, kind of talk about um, Samuel. I want to read 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 10. And, um, and as, as you guys are turning to 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 10, um, you know, one of the things that I, when you study revival, one of the things that really weakens revival is so much familiarity to what God does that you're not grateful for what he does. And I remember sitting on the front row of a church, uh, Bill Johnson was sitting next to me, and someone was, they were giving testimonies. And I forget what this man's testimony was, but I remember it was something like this. When I came tonight, I had this pain in the top of my pinky. And I wasn't even praying to get healed, but during worship, God healed me. And everyone's like, <laughs> gave a nice golf clap, you know? It's like, I'm glad your pinky feels better. I have pain all over my body, you know, something, you know. And then I look to my left and there's Bill going, thank you, God. God, thank you for doing that. You're so good, God. He, it, it, it struck me so hard because he disciplined his heart to celebrate God no matter how small the miracle was. The problem with revival is that healings start happening, salvations start happening, and then we become so familiar. It's like the first time a blind eye opens and a miraculous healing happens in a service, people are like, this is amazing, praise the Lord, it's so great. And everyone's rejoicing. But if revival's continuing to go, by the 30th time a blind eye opens, everyone's like, yeah, I saw that before. That's great. Good for you, that's so good. Or I've seen that back healed. Yeah, I've heard of backs being healed, that's great. Instead of like, wait, God came and healed your back? God, that's amazing. And so we, we, I want us to always have that childlike heart when it comes to God moving. Yeah. All right, now let's get to the message. First Samuel <laughs> 3, 1 through 10. I love this story. Samuel was dedicated to, to the Lord from Hannah. Hannah uh, didn't have a baby. Actually, uh, she was barren and she came to the temple and she was so desperate for God that she was praying in a way that made Eli think she was drunk. And, um, and so Eli kind of rebukes her, and then she says, no, I'm actually just desperate. And so Eli says, well, God will hear your petition. So the Lord remembered her, and then she bore a son, and she dedicated him to the, to the Lord. And so now Samuel's in the temple helping the high priest, Eli, with the services of the Lord. And so let's start here. Now, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, 
And the word of the Lord was rare in those days, and there was no frequent vision. And at that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel and said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am for you. Called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went up to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. My son, lie down again. Now Samuel, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Have you ever done that before? Where you heard a call, but it wasn't someone who actually called you? You know, like, you're like, yeah, honey, what'd you want? And she, you know, or someone said another person's name, but you heard your name. Or how about this? What, what, what about, I, I mean, this happens to me and, and it's blowing psychologists' minds away, but it's like your phone rings and vibrates in your pocket and you look at it and no one called. How, how many of that happened to? I mean, this is like a common thing that's happening and actually it's a rewiring of our brains and they, they actually have a term for this now. It's called hypovibochondria or ring anxiety, <laughs> where they think their phone's ringing and it's not. Actually, they were studying different people and one of the studies I was looking at, this woman, she, uh, she's a farmer and she has cows and certain times they're in a pasture and they're not and she would always have her phone. She would work from her desk and her phone would be on vibrate and it, you know, the phone, when it vibrates, it made the sound like, er, and, and, and so, uh, and, and, and you know, cows make the sound called like, mer, and so, and so she was having this problem and they were studying her because every time she thought her phone was ringing, it was the cow mooing. And every time she thought the cow was mooing, it was her phone ringing. Like her brain was messing with her. And, um, but I feel like this happens uh, often, uh, even when it comes to the Lord, where the Lord calls us and we go to other people and say, what do you need? What do you want? And God's like, no, I'm calling you. Let's keep going. Start at verse eight again. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, here am I, for you called me. And then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down to this place, and the Lord came and stood. I love it. It's like God kept coming closer and closer. He's like, finally, I'm gonna come and stand here calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel, exclamation point. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. And then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I'm about to do a new thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. You know, what's interesting about this relational dynamic in the temple, if just to give you a picture, they are actually uh, sleeping in the temple uh, the high priest, uh, his duties there, he has to keep that lamp lit throughout the night. It goes out right before the morning. So we know that this happened at night, probably just before the morning. And they're sleeping near the presence of God. Two things that are there, the Ark of the Covenant and the lamp stand. And they're sleeping there. And God's calling in a time when actually no one was hearing any Vision, no one was seeing any visions or hearing any voice of the Lord during that day. Now, the thing is, priests, uh, in, according to Leviticus, priests is a heritage. To become a high priest or to become a priest, you need to be of a certain clan, the Levites, and, and, and so you would have to be born into priesthood. But Samuel wasn't born into it. See, so the difference is Samuel was being called to be a prophet. And now, of course, we're grafted in to be priests, right? We're priests too now, if you accept Christ as your life. But also there's this calling that calls us, a prophetic calling that's on our life that's constant after us. His presence of God is calling out to us, are we listening? And I, I, I was just writing as some of us, I feel like we're, sometimes we're relaxed priests with no prophetic ear. 
living this Christian lifestyle, maybe even coming to church and, and doing you know, church, but the reality is, is God's calling us and we're not responding or we're responding to other things. God's calling us and we're like, what's the news doing? God's calling us and we're like, Let's, let me think about all these relational conflicts I have. God's calling us and it's like, I wonder if I should start another business. And, it's like God, and God's like, hey! And Jesus has a story in Matthew 22 where he talks about you know, the, the, the king sending out an invitation for a wedding and uh, the people who he invited had no consideration, were even mean and horrible. And, and so he's like, well, then we're just gonna invite everyone. And, and at the end of the, of the, of the story, uh, Jesus says, Few uh, says many are called, but few are chosen. I used to that used to bother me in, at first because I'm like, many are called, but few are chosen. God, that doesn't seem fair. It's like it's like everyone going. It's like me going. Everyone, everyone, come around, come around, please come, please come, everyone, come. Okay, I'm going to choose you. You no, not you. Yes, you with the hat. Yep, you. And no, I'm sorry, I know, I know I called you, but I'm not choosing you. Uh, we're gonna choose you over here and you over there. I'm like, God, that doesn't seem fair. It's like, if you called everyone, why can't everyone be chosen? That doesn't seem right. But that's because we're thinking of it in the wrong context and in the wrong way. Actually, it's more like this. I don't know if you've grew up doing this. And I, and I actually gave this example at the vision night of the youth group because God gave it to me. And I was like, I'm gonna use this for service, but... I've been, uh, I, you know, I grew up playing uh, dodgeball. How many of you grew up playing dodgeball? You know, not, now, now uh, a, a lot of the younger kids, they don't do it as much because it's too hurtful. Uh, they've become very sensitive. And, uh, you know, but me growing up, we were like, you know, we would do, you know, we would, we would do anything with dodgeball. We're like, uh, we don't have softballs. Let's use this volleyball, this soccer ball. How about this baseball? Like, this will work, Right. <laughs> And it's like, you, you weren't just out. You were out when you couldn't throw anymore. You were like crawling off the dodgeball, right? It was just, you know, it's a crazy thing. But, um, you know, obviously we would try to play these games at dodgeball. And we, so that we, it might be after school, it might be during recess, it might be during gym. And we, and we would try to make a call out like, hey, guys, we're going to play dodgeball. And there's people talking, there's people doing other activities, there's people who are just ignoring us. And, and then there's people who say, hey, I'll play. And then we would say, we choose you. We choose you. See, Jesus, he has this prophetic call. He has this call in our life. He has, he has this thing. He's saying, hey, come to the table. Come into my presence. Have habitation of, your, of my presence in your life. And those who respond and say, I sign up for that. He says, then I choose you. There's hearing the call versus answering the call versus ignoring the call. And I just wanna invite you to stand right now. Because even though God did other things this morning, so we won't go into too much detail about the actual topic, but I think you guys get the picture here. There's a call of God that's going out in the earth even to Christians who are saying, you might be doing your priestly thing and your routine, but there's there's more than just your priestly duty. There's that prophetic call that I have for your life. And I wanna commission you for it. And so I wanna pray for you because the presence of God, he wants habitation in our life. And instead of of ignoring the call or answering other calls, that we would every day, maybe every moment, say, God, I I choose, I answer the call. I'll step forward and say, yep, I want my family to be a habitation for you. I want my life to be a habitation for you. And then the Lord says, well, I choose you. Lord, we answer the call, whatever it might be. Even though in our earthly strength and our earthly thinking, 
It's hard for us to perceive in something like this, but we'll answer the call. We'll say, Lord, we'll, we're ready to join the habitation of your presence. Lord, thank you for choosing us. Thank you that we can be called the chosen. Lord, I pray that you would commission us to share the love of God in this city, to share the love of God with everyone we encounter. We answer the call for the mission on this city. Lord, would you reveal the fullness of that mission to us as a church? Lord, we thank you that you are willing to call us and to choose us. In Jesus' name, amen.